Hi everyone, welcome to this new episode of Caroline Talks. I'm your host Caroline Hayes, film critic and journalist, and this is one of my interviews at the 2024 Toronto International Film Festival. And I'm very happy to be joined by the filmmaker Gabrielle Brady to talk about her film, The Wolves Always Come at Night, which is a um, is a mixed between a documentary and a fictional drama about this family living on the Mongolian steppe which is their uh, open grasslands and they move to the city due to an unfortunate event and we're going to discuss that. The, t the film talks about climate change but I think it also talks about um, about how moving from one place to another even within your own country it is immigration and it is migration and about the toll that takes on the, on the psyche of the two characters um daba and his wife zaya but thank you so much Gabriel, for joining me today yeah thank you so much for having me thank you so um tell me about this about just about the concept of this film because i know the two leads um daba and zaya they're played by their their fictional characters but they're played by two actual mongolian um um, performers and they also co-wrote this film with you so talk to me about how you start how you got together with them and how the concept for the film came about okay so they're not fictional characters so Dava and Zaya are themselves and oh, they're playing themselves I was wondering they about are that themselves yeah so let's um let's dive in this is the space that gets me very excited is this hybrid uh, space uh, between documentary and fiction mm. So Daba and Zaya are Mongolian herders. Mm -hmm. They um, they did have this event that happened in their life. They were forced to move to the city. Um, and in a way, a lot of the events, a lot of the moments and scenes yeah. that play out in the film are of their life, you know? And, and in terms of the form, is either shown through observational documentary or something a little more reconstructed, which is where the writing came into it. Um, you know, we were co-writers together and, and really putting together this vision for the film. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting because it raises a lot of questions about film and, and what is fiction and what is documentary. Right. And, you know, and and naming something is, is such a political act. Um, and I think for me, you know, in a lot of ways, a film is a film, but at the same time, there's a certain honesty that we want with our, our audience. So to, to name it as a hybrid film felt very right because it's, it's not fictional, this is their story and that shouldn't be devalued, but at the same time we use fictional elements to to kind of, as you said, to go inside their psyche, the psychology of the process, um, you know, to kind of create something a little more expansive, um, which also kind of delves into magic realism and some of these moments that, that Dava and Zaya experienced. Um, yeah, and the hybrid works because the thing is with this film, there's certain things that you can't <coughs> plan for, and they're very realistic. For instance, like one of the first scenes in the film is Daba helping one of his um his goats to give birth. And I was thinking there's like and I've seen like a few films kinda of that that where they're kinda of like very realistic where you can't predict when an animal will give birth and like how it could become like a problem where he has to actually step in and help her to give birth. And then there's also like um just I think like the sandstorm yeah like you can't predict that yeah. there's and you if you do it on set it's like this big mass massive production like, the first thing that would come to mind would be a film like Mad Max you know which is like very a lot of VFX but this film isn't about that because I think to use something like VFX what would as you're saying devalue would actually devalue what you're talking about because it's about environmental conservation you know it's about the, the effects of technology on the environment so I think like keeping the film as real as possible and but also adding in those fiction elements I guess with regards to how you structured the story because it does have you know like a progression and I like how the film like you I was looking at the timeline almost exactly half of the film is in Mongolia mm -hmm. in the in this on the step and then the end the last second half is mm -hmm. with them um, in the settlement close to the city, so I was like, mm. even the way you structured it, had like you just gotta keep that fictional element mm. just for like the story purposes. Mm. I think this is the thing with documentary that is so alive. You have these transformative moments that no one can control, and so when that kind of shows itself. The way people respond, you know, Dava and Zaya responding to the birth of animals. We filmed the, you know, we, we made the filming in spring, which is the animal birthing season. The stakes are very high. The the sense of loss is kind of like always at the edges of their of their reality. So 
they can respond to that. This is this is very um, they're very real. The threat is very real, you know. So therefore, the performance is very honest. It's very true. Um, exactly like you said, a sandstorm is not something that can be written in the schedule and created. It's something that's bigger and beyond us. Um, I think there's something almost transcendental about those moments in documentary. Um, but also when you're working with loose fictional scenes to kind of bring the two together so you have something so honest and raw but at the same time you have pieces to the story that can keep the narrative moving along um, yeah and the film it was really important that we ha held both pieces their life before this moment and their life after this moment and you know in a lot of ways there was kind of in the dramaturgical process it could have gone you know we could have just kind of been in one reality but <coughs> If we're just in the city, we don't know what's been lost. Mm. And in the conversations with Darwin and Zayat, they made it really clear. I need people to see where I've come from and what I've lost. Mm. So there was that invitation, but also dramaturgically thinking about like, how can we really know how someone ends, you know, the process of loss unless we've seen what's at stake. Um, so this was kind of really clear that in a way we needed this, you know, we needed this type of narrative. Okay. So I, I was going to ask this there, but I'm actually going to ask this now because it does tie into the hybrid hybrid nat nature of the film. So this is their life. They're documenting their life, but they're kind of doing it like most documentaries are present like as it's happening but because you guys wanted to make sure that the audience saw what they lost what was at stakes even for those still living on the step in the on the grasslands who had to take them back and that's typically not done for documentaries and usually if that's done it's in archival footage but you guys actually had to they had to rebuild their life on the grassland in order to dismantle it again to show what that process of moving is like. Talk to me about talk to me about what it was like just having them rebuild the life that they had yeah. to show people what they lost. I think yeah. that's such an interesting way to approach it. Yeah. So um, we actually met Dava and Zaya, and the invitation was very quick. Mm. They wanted us to start filming immediately. They were just moving to the city, right. so. The moments in the film where we see them, their whole life kind of piled up on this wagon, um, you know, trawling into the, the fringes of the city, that is the first moment we filmed with them and it's very documentary, it's very unfolding, yeah. setting up their entire livelihood, those first moments of, of insecurity and what is this going to be like. Um, so this is the thing, there was this foundation of documentary, but in our conversations, knowing we needed to go back, it was like, how can we do this? So with Dava and Zaya, like with so many Mongolian herders, there's always a foot still in the door to their to their landscape, their land, their homelands. You know, their uncle was still living there. Quite often they will go back to kind of help in busy seasons or tricky moments. So the idea of relocating back was very natural for them for a time. So they're, you know, they, they were still a gear there with family. Um, you know, this idea of kind of having one gear or one home in a place is not, it's not like how it is in the West. So it's a lot more fluid. So for them to kind of relocate was a very natural thing and was actually their idea. Um, so it was really us going up and setting up and thinking about how we could use this span of time. And really in that was a weaving of mostly observational documentary. Mostly this is spring, this is life, this is how it is. These are the dynamics, the relationships, these unfoldings with animals and you know, all these kind of very surprising moments. Um, and then trickled in that were a few of these points for the for their story that we need to kind of understand that we worked with more or less reconstructions. Mm -hmm. So it really was, yeah, a kind of blend between the two. Yeah, and I, I mean, love that. I love that they took that risk and they were like, you know, we're really gonna do this and really yeah. be as honest as possible. And there's a story that um, Zaya tells the kids um, at night and it's a story about this old woman who lived alone in a gear um, on the grasslands by herself and these visitors came and she invited them to drink tea. The tea when she served it was hot but when, <laughs> when they drank it was cold and one person didn't drink and that person survived but the others mysteriously died and when people went back the gear was gone mm -hmm. and I thought it was an interesting story at the beginning of the film because it kind of made me think of colonization which is essentially yeah. what the film is about. It's about colonization and, and how um, colonizers when they bring their culture and their beliefs and their um, their wants and their needs onto indigenous um, lands and yeah. indigenous communities 
the indigenous communities they're welcoming you know they're like we we're travelers like are we got here because our people were travelers too yeah. and like but they but then I, but by the end of the um, I think in the middle of the second half the film I was thinking that the it's not actually about colonizers <laughs> it's actually about immigrants mm -hmm. and migrants and how when people move yeah. to a, a new place and even if it's on their homeland like they're yes. still on their homeland but you are being the word that comes to my mind is infected I don't want to use infected but influenced yeah, yeah. influenced mm -hmm. by the westernization that has already yes. occurred there when you take it in you lose yourself yes and the only way you don't lose yourself is if you don't completely take yeah. it which is the person who doesn't drink yeah. right so I like how the fast story in particular wants to really get to the second part of the film and you realize what the film is really about the whole context of that story yes. too is so yes. tell us about having that fast story because I think that's in I love when there's films and there's like yeah. something in particular that just encapsulates the entirety of a film and the story and the concept and I think that story that Zaya told the kids is yeah. the story of the of of their family but also of the Mongolian people and mm -hmm. settlements and how and I think for any people who have like myself who are immigrants and migrants and just like trying to hold on to yourself mm -hmm. like to not lose yourself in this new environment oh, that's such a beautiful reading thank okay. you um I think on one very kind of um, you know more base level this you know the story itself evokes a sense of oncoming threat you know and this was a huge part of the, the first half of the film was to feel the sense of threat that we're not entirely sure what is it that is going to kind of engulf this place or engulf this family or engulf this way of life you know that we sense that something is approaching but we don't know entirely what it is and that um, you know the idea for that was very much that it mirrors the experience of people living there this this deep sense of unpredictability that is like a lurking shadow um, yeah but also uh, you know in, in more in its specificity the story for me is very much about that it's what um, what gets lost in the process of movement you know so for the history of time people have moved and they've had to readapt and they've had to refine and they've had to kind of um, rename themselves or re-identify with the place and in Mongolia for example it's happening really quickly yeah the the amount of people moving from the countryside to the cities you know it's a, it's a massive migration it's a massive migration and there was this beautiful article by a, a Mongolian writer who wrote the, the the valleys will be empty you know and so in that is is not also not a black or white judgment you know the need for movement what can also come from that perhaps opportunities for the next um, generation but still what gets lost what do we not have time to look at to magnify to understand what's being asked of us that's what I understood from Dava and Zaya in that process was this feeling of shell shock you know we've we've left everything we know but also Dava this umbilical cord almost was kind of severed and he was trying to find his way back to everything he knew his identity his sense of self which was seen as he, in his landscape and his relationship to the to the animal and natural world this is what he's trying to hold on to and I think that that to me is is so beautiful and so tragic at the same time and so in that contrast is is the film that's where the film sits yeah and it's about trying to hold on to not only the things that you value personally like for him he his horse he, he had a stallion he loved the stallion he was very gentle and he loved animals but like, this one thing is what he kept thinking about every time like there's these very haunting scenes of like a herd of ponies moving through and they're being herded and at the end he gets to write off and it's like is he going back home to the girl with um Zaya and the kids or is he going back to the mountains and like um the film is about go returning and i think that's a lot about what conservation is supposed to be about and what trying and what climate change is doing climate change climate change is cha taking, stripping away everything that people are trying to hold on to and in mongo and i coincidentally a few weeks ago i actually watched this um documentary i think it was by um south china news press i'm um, about the bankar which are their their, their, their dogs so, like these um, a particular um, breed of mongolian dog that they're using to herd um on the on the plains but the thing is these um dogs are actually part of conservation mm -hmm. because if they can control the grazing patterns of the shelf the herds they can like stop them from stripping away the soil because like there's the there's because they're trying to start desertification i think is what it's called yeah and your film 
actually it's not that because the reason the, sand st the sandstorms are occurring more and more is because there's less grass, the, yeah. the ground is drier, yeah. which is of course tied to um, rainfall or lack of rainfall. Like the things that we're doing in the West are affecting mm -hmm. people in Mongolia. Yeah. So talk to me about the aspect of the film about how it ties into conservation and climate change. Yeah, I think that um, the thing about climate change is that we we all know you know there's nothing there's no mystery to it anymore and at the same time do we really have words to describe what that really means for each of us you know i think when we think about um you know mythology or greek mythology there were ways of understanding the world through these mythological stories but climate change is it's so big and it's not written in mythology yet because it's something we've just created now. And so for me, this is the thing. It's something that's unseen in a way or, or, or we find it hard to grasp. It's, it's intangible, it doesn't have words. It just has, um, it has consequences. And I think when I met Dava, the, the feeling I had was this kind of watchman, you know, sitting at the front line, watching as this thing kind of comes towards him, ready to engulf his family you know waiting to engulf his entire community and wanting people to know you know so um this was something that that really kind of deeply moved me because it had in a way it started to have images and like you said you know java's experience moving to the gear districts he, he was physically haunted by the presence of of his horse that he had to let go of this kind of followed him around as an apparition or a kind of you know ghostly figure that haunting for me started to kind of take on a mythological uh, quality to it so it felt like hey this is very real this is this loss is very tangible this is very real um, this is something that I think we could, could create that people can connect to because climate change itself just talking about it it's a very loud world that we live in yeah right there's so much noise going on I didn't want this film to be loud out. It's very quiet. And there's a quiet tragedy, but it's very deep what he's experienced. And I think we feel that. You know, we feel that when we kind of journey with him through this and we understand that this moment in time for him, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Like this quantity of loss is, is immense. Yeah. And I think that ultimately is what we do face with climate change. Yeah, the climate change is the wolf. That's the wolf that's always coming at night. Absolutely. Um, thank you. We have to wrap it up. But thank you so much, Gabrielle, for talking thank to you. me. Yeah, this thank you so much. Thank and you. I yeah, look forward to, to seeing this later and I look forward to everybody seeing the film. Yes. Yeah. Post about where you can watch it um, and where it's movie screening at film festivals around the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.